Hello and welcome to the Diet Management for Cancer Prevention webinar. My name is Tamira Sidani, a specialist in the area of education, nutrition, and diabetes care. This webinar is offered by the Continuing and Professional Education Directorate at the University of Doha for Science and Technology. Here's an overview of the topics and the objectives that will be covered during this webinar. Some of the learning objectives include uh, identifying cancer's global burden through surveying statistics on cancer incidence and risk. We're also going to compare this to the uh, status of cancer in Qatar based on local reports. Uh, we're going to recognize the multifactorial nature of carcinogenesis. We're going to see some of the factors that uh, contribute to carcinogenesis and identify diet as one of its major potential contributory factors. Uh, then we're going to distinguish between naturally occurring dietary carcinogens and those introduced through food manipulation methods, such as preparation and preservation, um, and how these can be how, how these can lead to car, uh, carcinogenesis, can increase cancer risk, some of the mechanisms by which this is done, and we're going to identify the different categories of dietary carcinogen inhibitors, so how carcinogenesis can be manipulated at different stages and hopefully stopped or delayed. For this, we're going to describe plausible mechanisms of action for the dietary cancer inhibitors, meaning at which stages of carcinogenesis dietary interventions can make a difference. And we're going to identify additional factors that are not necessarily completely dietary, but possibly, probably related to diet in one way or the other, and that contribute to carcinogenesis. And we're going to articulate cancer prevention recommendations by major uh, bodies such as WHO and the International World Cancer Fund. Uh, I hope you find this useful and beneficial. So let's dive straight into the topic of this webinar, Diet Management for Cancer Prevention. So the major topics we're going to discuss today is facts and figures about cancer. Then we're going to talk about uh, the stages or steps in carcinogenesis and how nutrition can play a role in the different stages. Then we're going to discuss additional agents that are related to carcinogenesis. They can increase the risk of cancer formation. And then we're going to talk about carcinogen inhibitors that can be uh, consumed through the diet. Uh, we're talking about things like antioxidants, phytochemicals, and other components that can be found in different food items. And finally, we're going to identify additional agents that are not related to diet immediately, but are lifestyle factors that have chemo prevention potential, which means they have the ability to change the course of cancer formation at different points in time. So let's review some facts and figures about cancer to learn how much of a global burden it is. So let's, let's discuss some of the cancer facts that uh, you may have uh, come across uh, before. Cancer is a generic term for a large group of diseases and it involves the abnormal and uncontrolled division and reproduction of cells. And these cells have the potential to spread throughout the body. So if we were to define cancer in a simple feature, its defining feature would be the rapid creation of abnormal cells that can grow beyond their usual boundaries or checkpoints in cell division that are naturally found in the body in the normal cases. And it can then spread to other organs and tissues and they can get vascularized and change into tumors or masses. Uh, this process is referred to as metastasis. Metastases are a common cause of death from cancer. And uh, usually those abnormal cells generally arise because of alterations in the DNA of cells. And the, these result in the growth and spread of the related cells. So multiple checkpoint mechanisms for cell division can be escaped in the case of cancer. This is why the cell can proliferate uncontrollably, abnormally, and result in cancerous cells. Uh, however, having said that, cancers, uh, the survival rate with cancer has improved over time. And it's no longer thought about as a lethal uh, disease that's necessarily going to lead to death. Many of the cancers can be monitored over time and treated like chronic diseases, while others are still remain harder to treat and, lead, and they can lead to death. Uh, such changes that can lead to cancer are usually multifactorial in origin. There are multiple reasons by, uh, due to which cancer can be formed, and they can involve multiple agents. 
So my question for you at this stage is the following. What do you think are some factors that may contribute to cancer etiology? I'd like you please to take a minute or two, have a think about uh, some of those factors, pause the video and come back, join us again to see what the answers may be. Uh, okay, so when we talk about the multi multifactorial etiology, we have to speak about genetics. Uh, genetics are contributing factors to cancer formation, although it's not as um, big of a factor as some other factors, and you will go, you're going to see this in an infographic in the next slide. We have the environmental factors that are extremely important, exposure to pollutants, um, hazards in the workplace, uh, all the carcinogens that have been identified, uh, these exposures, chemical exposures can lead to uh, cancers. We have medical reasons such as infections. We have lifestyle reasons such as stress and uh, lack of sleeping or improper sleeping. And we have the diet and exercise, a big factor, sedentary lifestyle and the type of diet that is being consumed. And we have the smoking and substance abuse, perhaps one of the main uh, contributing factors to uh, cancer formation. So let's have a look here at the contribution of the different factors to cancer formation. As I mentioned earlier, the uh, genetic predisposition to cancer is really compared to the other uh, factors that contribute to carcinogenesis is much less than you would expect. So there are certain cancers that definitely have a higher risk of formation or of forming in the body because of genetic factors. And these include testicular cancer, breast cancer, things like kidney cancer and lung. However, the, the vast majority of cancers are formed due to other factors, environmental factors. And what do these environmental factors include? They include diet as a major contributory factor. It includes tobacco use, smoking. It includes alcohol. The state of obesity on its own is an independent risk factor for cancer formation. Infections, this is the medical aspect of cancer formation and some other factors. So diet, as you can see, and other lifestyle factors such as tobacco, alcohol use, and obesity, all of those increase the risk of cancer formation and all of those are modifiable and things that can improve the chances of avoiding cancer in a lifetime. So let's look at some statistics to see what the global burden of uh, uh, cancer really looks like. And these are statics, statistics from the WHO report on cancer. So uh, there is in 2018, cancer uh, was diagnosed in 18 million new cases, and it resulted in 10 million deaths. Uh, in 2018, the deaths were 15 million worldwide, and around 30% of those deaths are due to cancer. And it's predicted that in 2040, this is going to at least double. So 29 to 37 million new cases of cancer are going to be diagnosed. With those statistics, it's really something important for us to reflect on, especially in the healthcare professional field, that uh, what can we do? How can we raise awareness and uh, how can we follow a certain lifestyle that uh, reduces the risk of cancer incidence in our lives and the lives of patients that you speak to on a daily basis? Continuing with the cancer statistics, just to understand further what the global burden looks like, uh, in 2015, the WHO estimated cancer to be uh, the first or the second leading cause of death before the age of 70 in 134 of 183 countries in the world. So you can imagine that it is really a leading cause of death in so many parts of the world. And it's also estimated cancer to be the third or the fourth leading cause of death before the age of 70 in 22 additional countries. And these additional countries include Qatar. So basically the global burden includes um, the risk of falling sick, becoming, uh, having cancer and of dying from cancer. But another very important aspect that governments take into account when talking about cancer risk is the economical um, aspect. So how this is going, what kind of an economic burden is this on the governments in a country? So re research estimates that based on premature death and disability from cancer worldwide, the total economic impact of cancer is around 1.5% of the total GDP, which does not include direct costs of treating cancer. Uh, for Qatar, for example, this would equate to approximately 2.87 billion. 
So the WHO and the global health experts believe that significant costs from cancer could be mitigated by targeted, cost-effective interventions that have worked in multiple nations when they have been tried before. So this is really a thought-provoking provo statistic that makes us think twice about what are the measures that can be done on an individual basis uh, with healthcare institutions as governments to help mitigate the risk of cancer formation. Now, how does cancer look like from the Qatari perspective? Uh, when we talk about incidence, the Qatar National Cancer Registry uh, estimates that the cancer incidence is projected to triple between 2010 and 2030, and this is due to aging and population growth. Um, if you, really, the, the reports indicate that incidence is relatively lower than in other countries, and this is due to multiple reasons, including the fact that Qatar has a relatively young population. Obviously, this will change with time. So whilst in 2010, the proportion of the population over the age of 60 was only 20%, by 2050, this will have increased to around 20%. So the incidence of uh, cancer would also be expected to increase with the aging. Uh, population growth is another factor. Uh, as in other countries, cancer incidence increases with age and life expectancy. Uh, so life expectancy in Qatar continues to rise for both men and women. Uh, the incidence uh, is relatively uh, low now, but as we said, it's expected to, to grow. Uh, with respect to death from cancer, it is the second cause of death among non-communicable diseases. Cancer is the second cause. Uh, for QNCR, which is the Qatar National Cancer Registry, and WHO, the reports in 20, uh, the year 2020, this was the number of the population, around 3 million, and there were around 1,482 new cases of cancer, out of which 704 deaths have been registered. Uh, most common cancer types in Qatar were breast at 14.7%, uh, colorectal cancer at 11.7%, and prostate cancer at 7%. Additional facts from Qatar is that non-communicable diseases in Qatar account to one in two deaths. Uh, poor lifestyle and environmental factors may contribute to 40% of the cancer cases in Qatar. And the top five risk factors in Qatar for non-communicable diseases, as identified by the public health strategy, include the high body mass index, high blood pressure, high fasting plasma glucose, ambient particular, uh, particulate matter in the atmosphere and low whole grain intake. As you can see, four out of those five risk factors are things that are modifiable and things that are related to the diet and changes in diet may impact them directly or indirectly through impacting other risk factors, such as the high body mass index. With proper diet, this can be reversed and the cancer risk will be reduced further. Uh, the effect of lowering the high body mass index will be compounded uh, with the effect of having improved whole grain intake, which will improve the cancer risk. Additional associated risk factors for non-communicable diseases in Qatar would be physical inactivity, tobacco use, and high cholesterol levels. So as you can see, all of those risk factors are modifiable risk factors which takes us or highlights the importance of positive reinforcement of healthy diets and physical activity, and of course, environmental health. All of those may affect the ultimate trajectory of cancer incidence in Qatar. The WHO and the global health experts believe that significant costs from cancer could be mitigated by uh, po these positive reinforcements and the cost-effective interventions that have been shown to work in multiple places. So, the question again is yours at this point. What do you think is a priority in cancer prevention, whether globally, because you have seen the uh, global uh, statistics, or locally in Qatar? What would you expect the number one priority for cancer prevention to be? Please pause the video for a few seconds, have a think, and move on to see uh, the answer. The National Cancer Framework's vision for achieving excellence in cancer care in 2022 
set a cancer prevention priority to address lifestyle risk factors. This is true for multiple bodies, governing bodies that produce uh, preventive guidelines in multiple nations. So for Qatar, they have a cancer framework and the vision of achieving excellence in cancer care sets the priority for cancer prevention to address lifestyle risk factors. And we have included some of the risk factors that are of concern in Qatar. So I have mentioned them before, and I hope that you've been focused because the question is now for you. What are the areas that lifestyle medicine focuses on to improve health? So we've surveyed the risk factors for cancer. We have uh, agreed on the fact that the priority for cancer prevention in Qatar is to modify these risk factors. What are some of the lifestyle risk factors you can think of that will actually impact cancer risk? Again, please pause the video and continue when you're ready to check your answers. I hope many of you would have guessed some of those uh, risk factors. So nutrition is a main, main risk factor for cancer formation. Uh, healthful eating of whole whole food, plant-based foods. There's a great trend in nutrition now to go toward plant-based food. And we're going to discuss the, adva the advantages of going toward plant-based food as we go. And uh, note please that plant-based food does not mean a strictly vegetarian or vegan diet. It means a diet that is mostly based on uh, food from plant sources. So these people who uh, stick to a plant-based food are people who consume meat from alternative sources. It's just that the majority or the bulk of their diet is based on plant-based sources. Exercise is extremely important. Increasing physical activity is um, a documented uh, pr protective factor in cancer formation. Uh, relationships, form and maintain healthy relationships. Manage stress, develop strategies uh, that work for you to manage stress and seek assistance when you cannot do it on your own. Be free from substance abuse, avoid risky substances and get proper sleep, improve your sleep. And it's noteworthy that when we talk about lifestyle medicine and these factors, lifestyle factors that impact overall health, we're not just talking about cancer risk, we're talking about uh, all the lifestyle related risks. If you want, we're talking about lifestyle uh, diseases such as obesity, diabetes, hypertension, uh, hypercholesterolemia, all of those things that can be modified by lifestyle changes. So small changes in the lifestyle will lead to big effects, positive effects on all non-communicable diseases, including cancer. Now let's talk a little bit about carcinogenesis and what the role of nutrition in carcinogenesis could be. So when we talk about carcinogenesis, there are multiple genes that come into the picture and the interplay between these genes is what um, results in either cancer formation or cancer inhibition. So what is carcinogenesis really? It is the development of cancer and the development of cancer usually happens when a carcinogen or an agent that causes cancer comes and gets introduced to the cells. Um, researchers believe that changes in gene function cause normal cells to transform into cancerous cells. And we're going to talk about this in a few more details in a little bit. Uh, so these two genes, the interplay between these two genes, we have the oncogenes, which are altered genes that promote tumor growth and inhibit apoptosis. Uh, apoptosis is the programmed cell death, which is one of the mechanisms by which cells will stop dividing and will be controlled. Their growth and their number will be controlled. Uh, apoptosis inhibition allows for the survival of the genetically damaged cancer cells. So let's assume that there's a carcinogen that came and uh, made some changes in the DNA of the cell. And this damaged DNA would usually undergo apoptosis, program cell death so that it does not progress into cancer. When we have oncogenes, uh, apoptosis is inhibited. So unprogrammed cell growth is going to happen. No cell death is going to be, the checkpoint of cell death at this point is going to be deactivated. Uh, tumor suppressor genes are the opposite of oncogenes and they become deactivated in cancer cells. So the combination of having oncogenes and the deactivation of tumor suppressor genes is what's going to cause cancer formation. So the loss of function in tumor suppressor gene 
This can lead to unregulated cell growth and ultimately cancer. Uh, there are many examples of tumor suppressor genes, such as the BRCA1 and BRCA2, that are usually involved in breast cancer formation. Uh, so just to reiterate, carcinogenesis is the development of cancer. As we have mentioned earlier, it's an important uh, definition to learn. And another uh, important definition to learn is a carcinogen. Uh, usually carcinogenesis is induced by a carcinogen. It is a physical or a chemical or a viral agent that induces cancer. Uh, it interferes with the cells at the DNA level and it can introduce changes that can lead to cancer formation in the absence of or in the deactivation of the uh, cell division uh, checkpoints, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, carcinogenesis is a biologic multi-stage process, and it proceeds in a predicted um, way that is a continuum of three distinct phases. So originally we have initiation. Initiation uh, happens as a first stage of this continuum, followed by promotion and followed by progression. So what is initiation? Um, cell transformation that happens upon interaction with the carcinogen, and as we said, it happens at the DNA level, it usually occurs rapidly. The actual change occurs rapidly, but it can remain dormant until it is activated by a promoting agent. So after the initial cell damage has occurred, the transformation from a normal cell to a, detect to a detectable cancer can take years or even decades. And there are multiple factors that are going to come to the picture here and whether or not this cell transformation is going to lead to cancer. Uh, so the next step is promotion. And it, it, the initiated cells that, uh, in which damage has happened, they multiply and they escape the regulatory mechanisms, as I said earlier, in, in terms of cell division and then a neoplasm is formed. A neoplasm is a new and abnormal tissue with no useful function. It becomes vascularized and it progresses to cancer. So tumor cells at this stage aggregate and grow into fully malignant neoplasm or tumor with vascularization. It's going to continue to grow until it is detected otherwise. What do you think? At what stage, or even more than one stage probably, of carcinogenesis, would nutrition have an impact? So proper nutrition, would it have an impact in the initiation, promotion, or progression phases of carcinogenesis? Or would it have an impact at all? This is a question for you to contemplate. Please pause the video, think about it, and join me again to find the answer. Really and truly, nutrition can modify carcinogenesis at any of those stages that we have mentioned. Uh, it is estimated uh, by the World Cancer Research Fund that one quarter to one third of all cancers in higher income countries are due to poor nutrition, physical inactivity, and excess weight. So yes, poor nutrition does play a big role in carcinogenesis. Now, what are some of the uh, timings, points in time, when nutrition can play a role in carcinogenesis. It's in the carcinogen metabolism. So when we have, when we are in the uh, initiation phase, we said that the carcinogen is going to interfere with the DNA structure of the cell. So proper nutrition at this point can interfere with carcinogen metabolism, how it's going to be metabolized before it gets to damage the DNA of the cells. Uh, also in cell differentiation, the way cells uh, differentiate from being from an original stem cell into becoming a specific cell with a specific role, and how in this process a carcinogen can form a cancer as the cell is being differentiated, nutrition can stop that process at this point in time. Cellular and host defense, how the body and the cells can uh, defend the, the DNA from the carcinogen and the tumor growth, so which is the progression of the carcinogenesis, the very third and last point in the process. So I'm, at each stage of carcinogenesis, nutrition can play a specific role to prevent carcinogenesis. Now, at this point in time, I would like you please to attempt to make a list of dietary carcinogens. So when we talk about dietary carcinogens, we are talking about things that 
uh, can be naturally found or naturally occurring in food items that we consume or things that get introduced to our food through preparation techniques or preservation techniques. Some of you might have heard that preparation, certain methods of food preparation, such as grilling or broiling, might um, impact the nutritional value of food or might change or introduce carcinogens into the food. So also some preservation techniques might introduce specific carcinogens. So I'd like you to have a think, please, and to make a list of all the carcinogens, potential carcinogens of dietary nature that you can think of and uh, categorize them into either naturally occurring or introduced through uh, food manipulation. Please pause the video, take some time to research this and uh, come up with your answers and join me again for the answers. I hope you have managed to make a comprehensive list of the possible dietary carcinogens. Now, the pictures I've included in this slide are kind of suggestive of, of some food items that could be carcinogens. So let's move on with our discussion to talk about these items more thoroughly. Dietary carcinogens can either be naturally occurring or they can be introduced into foods through uh, food manipulation uh, techniques. Some of the naturally occurring carcinogens would be pesticides or herbicides, and these include aflatoxins and ochratoxins. And these are compounds produced by plants for their natural protection against fungi or insects or animal predators, or they could be mycotoxins. Um, mycotoxins are secondary metabolites that are produced by molds present in some foods. And this include maize and um, peanuts, cottonseed, and some tree nuts as well. And another naturally occurring uh, carcinogen is the heme iron that is found in red meat. So uh, heme iron is found in high levels in red meat, and it has been shown to promote colorectal cancer tumorigenesis in particular by stimulating the endogenous formation of carcinogenic and nitroso compounds. So nitroso compounds are the carcinogenic agents in heme iron uh, in red meat and uh, it increases the risk of colorectal cancer because it plays a role in tumorigenesis at this point. The second category we're going to talk about is the set of carcinogens that are introduced to food through food preparation techniques. Um, so, uh, for example, for red meat, cooking at high temperatures or when it's uh, exposed to heat for a long time, and uh, grilling, all of those introduce a specific set of um, compounds that have uh, carcinogenesis effects. So um, the primary hypothesis is that dietary enhancers of carcinogenesis may be the heterocyclic amines, the, H the HCAs, and these are formed usually when amino acids, which are components of protein in meat, uh, sugars and creatinine or creatine, all of those are found in muscles, react at high temperatures and they react in, at high temperatures regardless of the uh, method of, of uh, cooking, regardless of where or how this high temperature is being introduced. The, these are formed. So HCAs are formed and they are carcinogenic. Um, dietary enhancers also include saturated fat in red meat, possibly, or other or the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that form, or the PAHs, and these form on the surface of meat when being grilled at high temperatures. So basically, grilling, broiling, and barbecuing, which is charboiling meat, fish, or other foods of animal origin usually, with intense heat and over direct flame, results in fat dropping on the hot fire. So when this fat uh, drops, it causes flames, it causes smoke, and these flames contain polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and they stick to the surface of food. So again, when organic substances are burned incompletely and meat is being exposed to smoke, these PAHs are formed and they have a role in carcinogenesis. Now, the formation of these two compounds, HCAs and PAHs, varies uh, according to the meat type and according to the co cooking method and the doneness level of the meat, how it's going to be consumed. Is it rare or medium or well done? Obviously, the, the longer the duration, the more the concentration of these uh, compounds is going to be. Uh, <clears throat> now, what is so carcinogenic about these two compounds? These two compounds become capable of damaging DNA uh, at some point. 
and this point is only if they are uh, activated. So they damage DNA only after they are metabolized by specific enzymes in the body. And this process is called bioactivation. So what have studies shown? They have found that the activity of these enzymes, which can differ among people, may be relevant to the cancer risk associated with exposure to these compounds. So in other words, just the exposure to these compounds is not automatically going to mean carcinogenesis. It depends on the bioactivation and how the bodies react to to these compounds and how, what's their capacity for bioactivating these compounds. Uh, population studies have not established a definitive link between HCAs and PAH's exposure from cooked meats and cancer in humans. And this is possibly um, understandable because uh, one difficulty with conducting such studies is that it can be difficult to really to determine the exact level of HCAs and PAH's exposure a person gets from the cooked meat because uh, it's going to be confounded by so many different factors. And there's also, as we mentioned, the individual variation between uh, one person and the other in the activity of the enzymes that bioactivate the HCAs. So this will result in exposure differences. In 2015, an independent panel of experts convened by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and they determined that the consumption of red meat is probably carcinogenic to humans. It's a group 2A uh, classification. Uh, but they did not conclude that HCAs and PAHs were associated with cancer incidence. So the recommendations over here regarding red meat is to reduce the consumption of red meat. Uh, there's currently no federal guidelines to address the consumption of foods or upper limits containing HCAs and PAHs. There are no um, upper limits that have been uh, suggested or a call to control their intake. But there are dietary guidelines that recommend limiting the consumption of uh, red meat and processed meat. And we're going to talk a little bit more about processed meat as we move on. So the takeaway message here is that while HCAs and PAHs um, may or may not be a direct cause of cancer formation in humans, the general recommendations until uh, further evidence is suggested, suggests otherwise or suggests one way or the other, the general recommendation is to consume less red meat and uh, because it's associated with uh, these compounds that may be associated with an increased cancer risk. However, aflatoxins is or are a group of compounds that have been classified as carcinogenic to humans. So there's the International Agency for Research on Cancer that we had mentioned earlier that has made it its um, role to classify compounds into different categories in terms of their carcinogenesis potential. So the first group, group one, is car carcinogenic to humans. Other groups include um, possibly carcinogenic or probably carcinogenic to humans. Uh, and then a th fourth group is a group that uh, the carcinogenicity of these compounds have not been or has not been uh, fully identified. Uh, so aflatoxins, for example, are among group one uh, compounds which are carcinogenic to humans. Uh, other than aflatoxins, what made it uh, on the list for carcinogenic to humans among so many other compounds are the alcoholic beverages, uh, processed meats, the consumption of processed meats, obviously, and uh, some salted fish, we're going to talk more about this as we move on, and tobacco, whether be it smokeless or tobacco smoking or even secondhand smoking, all of those are known carcinogens. So moving on uh, to uh, other carcinogens, it's worth noting actually before we move on that uh, these carcinogens over here that we have mentioned here impact the carcinogenesis at the initiation phase. So as we said, dietary uh, factors can impact carcinogenesis at different points in time and at different points in the process of carcinogenesis. So here, uh, the compounds that we have mentioned over here impact carcinogenesis at the initiation phase. Animal foods such as meat and fish may be processed before consumption by smoking, curing, salting, or by adding preservatives. Uh, so uh, preservatives are usually added either to enhance the flavors or to prolong the shelf life, uh, the time during which these uh, products can be consumed. 
Uh, these meats are also cooked at high temperatures, and these combined methods of processing and preparation may affect the chemical composition as well as the nutritional value of these animal foods. For example, red and processed meats increase the risk of colorectal cancer. There's enough evidence for that. Cantonese-style salted fish also increases the risk of nasopharyngeal cancer, and this is the fish that I showed you the picture uh, of earlier. And foods preserved by salting increases the risk of stomach cancer. Uh, now let's talk a little bit more about processed meat in particular. Uh, it is invariably higher in fat content than red meat, which is, um, there's a theory that uh, the higher uh, fat, the higher the risk of cancer also. Uh, it, the theory says that it may promote carcinogenesis through the synthesis of secondary bile acids, albeit the, uh, the evidence for this is weak from human studies, but it's a little bit stronger in animal studies. Uh, so there's one factor. Uh, processed meat also has heme iron, um, and it also has a source of exogenously derived and nitrosal compounds due to the fact that nitrates are added as um, preservatives and flavor enhancers, which may in increase the carcinogenic potential. Obviously, being uh, from a uh, red meat source with heme iron, it already has the endogenous content of N nitrosal compounds. And then uh, upon being cooked at high temperature, the same tumorigenesis mechanism during cooking with the involvement of the compounds we have mentioned, also uh, the compounds being um, the HCAs and the PAHs, uh, also uh, increases its carcinogenic potential. Um, also another um, preservation technique that is uh, used traditionally is still uh, currently being used in multiple places in the world, and this includes uh, salting. So substantial amounts of salt preserved foods, such as um, salted meat or fish, and sometimes even vegetables and fruits get salted, um, heavily salted for preservation purposes. Uh, this is a traditional method of preserving raw fish, raw fish throughout uh, much of the world, really. And salt preserved fish may also undergo fermentation. It depends on the conditions around it. Uh, for example, the Cantonese-style salted fish, uh, which usually, usually has less salt as compared to other fish that are preserved by salt, but have a higher degree of fermentation, these fish contain, uh, uh, different samples of them have shown that they contain nitrosamines and nitrosamine precursors. Uh, one such nitrosamine, which is uh, nitros uh, dimethylamine, was found in some samples of these Cantonese-style uh, salted fish, and it has been shown to induce cancer development in experimental models in animals, particularly nasopharyngeal cancer. So when we talk about uh, processed meat, really, we're talking about uh, the preservation techniques that I've mentioned earlier, salting, curing, fermentation, smoking. Uh, to enhance flavor or to improve their preservation. Um, examples of these uh, processed meats include uh, ham, salami, pastrami, uh, sausages like frankfurters and hot dogs, bacon, and all of those are uh, food items to which nitrites or nitrates have uh, been added or other preservatives as well. Nitri nitrites and nitrates are used in meat because they bind to myoglobin, which inhibits the botulinum ex exotoxin production, so it prevents uh, food um, toxicity, but they are powerful carcinogens. Um, animal models have shown, with respect now when we talk about preserving food by salting, animal models have shown that high salt levels alter the viscosity, viscosity of the mucus protecting the stomach, and enhances the formation of N nitrosal compounds. Uh, the high salt intake also may stimulate the colonization of H. pylori, which is the strongest known risk factor for stomach cancer. Um, finally, in animal models, high salt levels have been shown to be responsible for the primary cellular damage, which results in the promotion of stomach cancer development. So what does the recommendation say? Uh, the recommendation by the American Cancer Society says, limit consumption of processed meats and red meats. World Cancer Research Fund International uh, says, or advises to eat no more than moderate amounts of red meat and little if any processed meat really. So processed meat has been shown to be a carcinogen, as we mentioned earlier, and red meat is probably uh, a carcinogen. So the, the, the less you can consume of these, um, food items, the better.
Now, moving on to dietary fat and whether or not fat has any role in carcinogenesis. It has been studied in relation to cancer risk and recurrence, and there has been an inconsistent link. So, so there's an inconsistent link between certain types of cancer and the amount of fat in diet. Um, some studies suggest a link with some cancers, while others don't. For example, one of those studies, the Women's Health Initiative, uh, a large prospective randomized trial that examined dietary fat consumption as part of the diet composition and all cancer mortality. And this study found that the adoption of a low fat dietary pattern led to a lower incidence of deaths after breast cancer, but there was no reduction in mortality from other cancer sites. But really, the link or the um, association is hard to establish, and this is due to multiple facts, one of them being that the diets high in fat, they often contain more meat, red meat particularly, and more calories, and having a high energy intake is also associated with increased risk and uh, overweight and obesity status, increased risk of cancer. So red meat and overweight ob and obese conditions, all of them increase the cancer risk. So that's one factor that may confound the effect of dietary fat on its own. Also, uh, as we have mentioned, uh, the dietary uh, the patterns of uh, preparing meat or fat containing food, which is usually meat, can increase the risk of cancer due to the carcinogenic compounds or potentially carcinogenic compounds produced. We also have the potential cancer promoting influence of the heme iron in red meat. So all of those factors makes it really hard to understand whether the uh, dietary fat intake being correlated with the intake of the other dietary components that also have an independent uh, increased risk of cancer formation. So what is the effect really? Is the effect due to fat or is it due to protein or to total calories or to the carcinogenic compounds that are being formed during preparation? All of this makes it hard to identify uh, or to isolate a single role for fat. It is hard to study uh, the effect of fat on carcinogenesis because of the potential confounding factors. What is the recommendation for dietary fat? Always, despite not having a causative uh, relationship, uh, sometimes the uh, bodies that send or generalize guidelines prefer to err on the safe side and make recommendations that make uh, or that render a higher protective effect. So recommendation with respect to fatty food is limit fast foods and other processed foods that are high in fat, starches or sugars, as this helps control calorie intake and maintains a healthy weight. So due to the effect on other aspects of health, it should also be limited. And we're not just looking at this independently in terms of cancer risk. We are looking at it from a holistic a health promotion point of view. Uh, foods that are high or fast foods and high in processed foods, uh, these include potato products such as chips and crisps. We're not talking about fast food meals that you buy from restaurants. Uh, products that are made from white flour such as bread, pasta and pizza. We're talking about cakes and pastries and biscuits and cookies and confectionery and many of the pre-prepared dishes or the frozen dishes that you buy up the freezer in the supermarket and go heat or warm up to consume. Now moving on to additional potential carcinogen, uh, carcinogens, dietary carcinogens, it's essential for us to look at sugar and non-nutritive sweeteners. There are so many different uh, words or terminology that is associated with sugar and non-nutritive sweeteners. We have things like um, naturally occurring sugars versus synthetic. We have things like artificial sweeteners and sugar substitutes, and we have added sugars. So as a quick survey, uh, sweeteners is anything that makes <laughs> the food sweet, obviously, it's self-explanatory, and it may be derived either from naturally occurring substances uh, we're talking about fruits that are rich in fructose, we're talking about honey, milk that has lactose, we're talking about sucrose that can be isolated from things like uh, sugar beets, uh, sugar maple sap, sugar cane, and some herbs that are naturally sweet, such as stevia, um, cinnamon is also naturally sweet, and sugar alcohols, um, such as xylitol, sorbitol, and mannitol, all of those are found in some fruits, or from synthetic sources. Uh, for example, sucrose is refined and produced in large amounts in factories. 
Um, when we talk about artificial sweeteners, these are usually synthetic sugar substitutes. They are used instead of sugar, and they are known for their intense sweetening. They're usually many more, many times sweeter than sugar, so they are used in a fraction of the original amount, in minute amounts, and they produce a big um, or um, an intense sweetening taste, despite them being used in a fraction of the amount that regular sugar would have been consumed. Uh, some of these the artificial sweeteners are popular alt alternatives to sugar because they add virtually no, no calories to the diet. Uh, there are multiple names for these. This could be referred to as low calorie sweeteners. Uh, obviously, artificial sweeteners is one of them as well. Uh, Non-nutritive sweeteners and high intensity sweeteners. Um, sugar substitutes also include sugar alcohols. Uh, these are not considered non-nutritive sweeteners simply because they do have calories. They have half the uh, amount of calories that sugar does. So if one gram of sugar would give four calories, just like any other carb, uh, one gram of a sugar alcohol would give half of it, that's two grams. Uh, they are used, however, just like art other artificial sweeteners are used, simply because they reduce the amount of calories that's being consumed. Uh, the word added sugars also appears on so many uh, packages, and um, really, uh, most of the sugars in the diet come from added sugars. Uh, these foods are foods in which uh, sugar does not naturally occur in them, but they contain um, sugar that is being added, uh, such as beverages, uh, puddings, salad dressings, for example, some of them, sauces. If you notice multiple pasta sauces, you will see that uh, if you look at the ingredients list, you will see that sugar is one of them. Pies, um, frozen desserts. Uh, most baked foods really have uh, sugar added to them. So whenever uh, the sugar is not naturally occurring in the product itself, it's added sugar. Uh, so when you see um, like in the same manner, when you see a food package that says uh, no added sugar, it doesn't automatically mean no sugar because there's a naturally occurring sugar that could be in it. So these are uh, words or terminology that we need to be aware of when we're talking about sugar and non-nutritive sweeteners, especially for patients with diabetes. So when it comes to sugar and non-nutritive sweeteners, the FDA has approved eight non-nutritive sweeteners for use in the food supply. The FDA regulates them as food additives and they are generally considered as safe when used in moderation. The statement made by the FDA generally recognized as safe is to indicate that there is no clear uh, risk uh, that has been documented yet or so far from the consumption of these um, food additives. So these include uh, A-sulfame K, uh, aspartame, monk fruit, um, sucralose, saccharin, and stevia. Not every product that's made from stevia has been approved by the FDA, by the way, but only some of them. Now, what is the potential relationship then between sugar and cancers? There's a set of plausible biological mechanisms through which sugars may increase the cancer risk. And this is uh, summarized in the following figure. So the uh, generally agreed upon hypotheses with respect to carcinogenesis include elevated blood glucose, which would lead to elevated blood insulin, which would lead to elevated insulin-like growth factor, which induces cell proliferation and differentiation, thus increasing the risk for cancer. There's also the uh, hypothesis of increased inflammation. Uh, the case of inflammation or the state of inflammation causes altered gene expression or meets with the pathway of elevated blood glucose at the elevated insulin-like growth factor, both of which are known to increase uh, cell proliferation and differentiation. Oxidative stress is one of the big, big mechanisms and how uh, being in a state of oxidative stress can cause DNA damage, thus, thus making the um, cell proliferation um, in action more often than it should because the, it will skip the uh, regulatory mechanisms. And obesity in itself is possibly one uh, mechanism or one state in which different mechanisms will be uh, interplaying to get to a state of an increased cancer risk. So in addition to oxidative stress, in addition to hormonal imbalances, angiogenesis, blockage of apoptosis, 
uh, insulin resistance, all of these are conditions that are also conducive of cell proliferation and differentiation. And it's a really nice figure to look at over here because it shows very clearly how dietary um, factors can, um, can be actually working at different uh, steps of those pathways in order to stop the pathways before it increases the cancer risk. Uh, some studies have suggested that high glycemic diets, uh, which cause the highest rise in postprandial blood glucose, uh, may increase cancer risk. How? By creating higher levels of insulin-like growth factor in the body. Uh, let me explain this a little bit more. Now, first, what is a high glycemic uh, diet? A uh, high glycemic diet is a diet that includes foods of high glycemic index. Uh, high, uh, the glycemic index basically is a measure of the predicted rise in blood glucose uh, upon ingesting 50 grams of, of any carbohydrate food uh, as opposed to or as compared to the consumption of 50 grams of pure glucose. So if you were to plot this on a graph, uh, 50 grams of pure glucose will actually um, raise the blood sugar in a pre predicted manner or in a measured manner and they compare the ability of a carbohydrate food to raise blood glucose uh, as compared to the ability of pure glucose to raise blood glucose. And uh, according to how it uh, acts, how this carbohydrate food acts with respect to or when compared to the way 50 grams of glucose would increase the blood um, level of glucose, it is either classified as food of high glycemic index or moderate glycemic index or low glycemic index. So if a food, uh, if the index or if a food raises um, the blood glucose um, highly uh, after eating postprandially, it will have a score, a glycemic index of 70 or more. If it's moderate, it's the glycemic index is going to be somewhere between 55 and 69. And if it's low, it's going to be less than 54. So uh, these studies suggest that high glycemic diets, the foods that are consumed that consistently raise the blood glucose on the higher end, these have been associated with increased cancer risk. And the mechanism is the elevated insulin-like growth factor which uh, induces continuous growth through uh, cell proliferation. A systematic review investigating the consumption of sugars, uh, sugary uh, foods and sugary beverages in relation to cancer risk is uh, what suggested really these mechanisms and what suggested the increase, um, the increased cancer risk with this consumption. One of the studies that's very big talk about this is a study, uh, the acronym for it is called uh, EPIC Italy. This study is a large prospective study on glycemic index and glycemic load and cancer risk. Uh, there's a difference between glycemic index and glycemic load. I'm going to explain briefly what glycemic load is right now. Um, so the glycemic load is a measure of the total glycemic effect uh, of a uh, certain food. It's an indicator of insulin demand of the diet. So how much insulin is going to be produced by the body in response to the uh, amount of sugar or the glycemic load that has been uh, consumed. So it is the product of the individual food's glycemic index and its available carb content, uh, how much of it is available. So this is the effect of the total carbohydrates consumed. So high glycemic index diet was associated with an increased risk of colon and bladder cancer. And the high glycemic load diet was associated with increased risk of colon and diabetes related cancers and a decreased risk of rectal cancer. Another study, which is a systematic review of 37 prospective cohort studies, this looked at the consumption of sugar and sugar products and cancer risk, and it found associations between dietary sugars and cancer, and that these associations vary by the cancer site. Collectively, there were no associations observed, but some findings suggested a potential detrimental impact of added sugars, dietary fructose, and sugary beverages on cancer etiology. So what matters really is the quality of the carbs that are being consumed and how it impacts specific cancers that can be differentiated by site. So this is a really important um, finding if you want or an important study because it would it, it 
ultimately differentiates between the types of sugars that are being consumed and the risk of cancer. This is the basis of the following recommendations by the World Cancer Research Fund International. Limit the consumption of sugar sweetened drinks and drink mostly water or unsweetened drinks. So the general recommendation is not to go for uh, added sugar or added uh, or sugar sweetened beverages. The dietary guidelines for Americans um, specifies that people should limit the foods and beverages that are higher in added sugars. Uh, added sugar should be very limited, limited to less than 10% of the total calories per day. And this is true starting at age of two. So really and truly as, as parents and um, as educators, uh, it's us who introduce or um, who um, help shape the dietary habits of our children and of our um, clients' children. So really, it's extremely important not to introduce these children to uh, foods of the sort, because otherwise they would have no clue that they exist, at least <laughs> at this age. So really and truly, uh, our choices as parents would reflect and uh, dictate to a large extent the choices of our children, especially what we uh, kind of um, make their palate introduced to at an earlier stage and uh, help them uh, develop good food preferences rather than uh, more detrimental ones when it comes to their health. Uh, moving on to survey the potential effect on carcinogenesis, we are going to look at proteins. Um, most high protein diets really are high in, have a high meat content and fat content and low low fiber. Uh, I believe this <laughs> is kind of telling uh, about what I'm going to say next. So it's very similar to what we talked about when it came to fats. It's really hard to isolate the effect of one macronutrient over the other because of the certain dietary patterns that come based on our food choices. So diets high in protein that are not plant-based or vegan or vegetarian, usually most of them will be high in meat and accordingly high in fat content and accordingly low in fiber unless people have very specific um, choices have made um, conscious choices of including fruits and vegetables and other sources of fiber uh, into their diet now what is the potential uh, link between protein and carcinogenesis for protein to have an effect on carcinogenesis, there are multiple factors. Um, these factors include to the type of protein being consumed, uh, the origin and the type of the tumor that we're talking about, and the overall calorie content of the diet. Why calorie content? Because uh, simply it relates to the body weight regulation. And we have mentioned earlier that um, the state of overweight or obesity is really uh, an independent risk factor also of our, um, a factor that increases the risk of cancer. Uh, one study uh, that I have uh, come across, an important study, uh, something, uh, it's a study that actually uh, confirms findings by other studies. It suggests that high protein intake in middle ages in uh, people between 50 and 64 years of age, uh, it corresponds to a fourfold increase in cancer death risk and a 75% increase in overall mortality. These people were followed for 18 years, and this finding was one of the major findings that um, it reported, the study reported. So restricting protein intake can lower uh, the IGF-1 levels, and it can be cancer protective, which means it slows the tumor progression, and this was true in animal studies. Now, the very important part uh, or aspect uh, in the study was that um, these associations with the, the fourfold increase in cancer death risk and the increase in overall mortality was either completely abolished or attenuated if the proteins were plant derived. So these findings were not true when the protein was from a plant protein. And this uh, calorie or protein restriction should not happen in the elderly, people of 65 years uh, of age or more, because then the effect will be uh, reversed. So high protein intake was associated with reduced cancer and overall mortality in respondents over 65. 
So it's important for the elderly, people above the age of 65, to have an adequate protein intake. Perhaps one of the most important dietary recommendations for the elderly is to maintain an adequate protein intake. Even if uh, the elderly is in a state of overweight within a certain limit, uh, you will not necessarily always advise them to lose weight. It really will have to depend on their particular set of risks and medical condition and whether or not weight loss is advisable. And if weight loss is, adv is advisable at this um, or in this age group, it should be extremely, extremely uh, well monitored so that they do not de develop any protein deficiencies because protein deficiencies at these, uh, in this um, stage of life could be uh, a risk factor for so many other diseases, not only cancer. So what is the recommendation with respect to protein? It says to eat more plant-based proteins, such as legumes, nuts, and seeds. And this is from the American Cancer Society and the American Institute for Cancer Research. Obviously, it would also be for the dietary guidelines for Americans and for so many other um, institutions that set similar recommendations. Um, now it's your turn again. I would like you to refer to the previous list now that we have surveyed so many dietary um, factors that may impact carcinogenesis. I would like you please to refer to your previous list of dietary carcinogens that you have um, attempted before our discussion. And I would like you please to update it based on this discussion using the following template. So you've already made a list in the previous a pause that you had for this video. Now what I'd like you to do is to look at your list again and see did you miss anything? Did you have um, a misconception on one or more of the dietary of uh, agents that you thought might be carcinogenic? Uh, are there things that you have missed? Are there things that you weren't so sure of and that became more uh, evident? Template for you to use. So, what are the dietary carcinogens that are naturally occurring and those that are related to food preparation and those that are related to food preservation? So, at this point, please pause the video, take some time to summarize and tabulate your findings, and re uh, repeat the last part of the video if you need to in order to make sure that your list is comprehensive. Now, moving on, there are additional agents that are uh, linked to or related to carcinogenesis that are not necessarily um, immediately of dietary origin, but they can be impacted by the diet uh, sometimes. So let's have a look about, at what these additional agents could be. Alcohol consumption is one of them, as you have seen in the statistics that I have shown, showed you at the beginning. Um, for example, alcohol consumption was responsible for 3 million deaths a year globally in 2018. Uh, there are 200 diseases and injury conditions that are associated with alcohol consumption. These injury conditions include cirrhosis, infectious diseases, cardiovascular diseases, early dementia, and definitely cancer. 13.5% uh, of the total deaths in people aged 20 to 39 years was due to alcohol consumption. So alcohol consumption causes death and disability relatively early in life. Uh, <clears throat> definitely alcohol consumption is one of the things, uh, the one of the most important things that one can do to improve uh, their health. How is alcohol associated with cancer? There is a strong scientific consensus that alcohol drinking can cause several types of cancer. And this image here is from the Na National Cancer Institute, and it shows which cancers in particular are associated with drinking alcohol. So cancers of the mouth, of the throat and the voice box, the esophagus, breasts, uh, liver, colon, and rectum. And obviously there are additional uh, sites that are not mentioned in this particular infographic. Now the International Agency for Research on Cancer and the National Toxicology Program of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services both list alcoholic beverages or alcohol consumption as a known human carcinogen category one or class one. 
uh, alcohol consumption is also associated with an increased risk of overall mortality in cancer survivors and an increased risk of cancer recurrence. So not only does it pause an increased risk for uh, cancer to happen in the first place, but it also in, uh, increases the risk of overall mortality in those who survived cancer, and it increases the chances of recurrence of cancer. So there's really uh, strong, strong evidence that uh, alcohol consumption uh, is something that you need to drop if you were to worry about cancer risk. So what are some hypothesized mechanisms by which uh, alcohol can lead to um, cancer formation? So first, number one is acetaldehyde formation. Acetaldehyde is um, a product of metabolizing ethanol. Ethanol is found in alcoholic drinks. It gets metabolized into acetaldehyde, which is a toxic chemical and it's a probable human carcinogen. It can damage both the DNA and the proteins that are associated with the cells. <clears throat> another, another mechanism by which uh, alcohol can uh, cause or increase the risk of cancer is the state of oxidation and the reactive oxygen species. We're going to talk a little bit more in details about what the state of um, <clears throat> uh, what the state of oxidative stress means. So the state of oxidation and the presence of reactive oxygen species also causes DNA, protein, and lipid damage. Uh, generating reactive oxygen species, which are usually chemically <coughs> reactive molecules that contain oxygen, can damage DNA, as we said, through the process of oxidation. Uh, the third mechanism is nutrient malabsorption. So uh, alcohol consumption has the ability to impair the body's ability uh, to break down and absorb a variety of nutrients, and many of those nutrients may be associated with cancer risk, uh, with reducing cancer risk in particular, including vitamin A, uh, nutrients in the uh, vitamin B complex such as folate, and then also vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, and carot carotenoids, all of which are antioxidants and play a major role in uh, reducing the oxidative stress state in the body. Uh, the fourth mechanism is an estrogen surge, um, increasing blood levels of estrogen, which is a sex hormone that is usually linked to breast cancer risk, can happen as a result of alcohol consumption. So really, multiple uh, ways or mechanisms have been hypothesized to explain the potential um, increased cancer risk with alcohol consumption. What is the recommendation then with respect to alcohol consumption and cancer risk? Obviously, the World Cancer Research Fund International uh, urges people not to consume alcohol at all for cancer prevention. So their statement is, for cancer prevention, it's best not to drink alcohol. Another agent that is expectedly uh, contributing to cancer formation is smoking. Smoking is a leading cause of cancer and death, and death from cancer, not only uh, cancer occurrence, but also death from it. And smoking tobacco or the use of smokeless tobacco, chewable, for example, uh, is a cause of cancers of the mouth, the pharynx and the larynx. It also increases the risk of at least 14 additional cancers, including breast cancer, liver cancer and cancer of the esophagus. The, again, going back to the carcinogens that have been classified by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, I take you back to um, the group one, uh, some of the group one compounds, which are carcinogenic to humans. And as I mentioned earlier, these include tobacco, which is smokeless, like the one that is chewed. Uh, tobacco smoke, even secondhand, is a group one carcinogenic uh, agent, and direct tobacco smoking. Uh, let's survey some of the statistics from the WHO that are related to the use of tobacco or smoking. Um, tobacco kills up to half of its users. Every one of two tobacco users are going to die because of using tobacco. There, are eight, there have been 8 million deaths due to tobacco use, and more than 7 million of these deaths were due to direct tobacco use, whereas around 1.2 million deaths were due to second-hand uh, tobacco use based on 
um, the, based on reports from different studies worldwide. Uh, additionally, there are 1.3 billion tobacco users worldwide, and more than 80% of them live in low and middle income countries. And why is this important to mention? Why is it important to mention that they live in low and middle income countries? Because very likely they're not going to have the best health services uh, available uh, to treat these patients from the uh, adverse effects or the from the adverse results of using tobacco especially if it is for a long long time uh, further uh, smoking accounts for 42 percent of deaths from mouth and oropharynx cancers worldwide and it contains at least 50 different carcinogens uh, group one carcinogens which means they have been documented and reported as definite carcinogens uh, mechanisms linking smoking to carcinogenesis include the activation of an inflammatory pathway. So through the activation of the nuclear factor kappa B, uh, which is a transcription factor that is involved in inflammatory and immune responses, as well as in regulation of expression of many other genes related to cell um, survival, uh, proliferation, and differentiation, this might lead to carcinogenesis. We have discussed earlier that these are the mechanisms, one of the hallmarks or some of the hallmarks of cancer formation when uh, a cell escapes or a gene uh, transcription escapes corrective measures or the cell proliferation escapes um, mechanisms, regulatory mechanisms. Um, there is additionally, which is very important, there's a synergistic effect between smoking and alcohol consumption. It, in many people, most people actually, this happens, uh, the, uh, these two um, behaviors happen together, go hand in hand, uh, smoking and alcohol consumption. So uh, when combined together, they increase the risk of cancer uh, formation. For example, uh, benzopyrene is one of the cigarette smoke carcinogen. It has the ability to penetrate the esophagus. This is why it increases the uh, and the cancer risk in the esophagus. But when combined with ethanol from alcohol, it actually, the, um, the ability for um, benzopyrene to penetrate the esophagus increases further. So uh, this is definitely something to consider uh, when talking about, to people about cancer risk. So what do you expect the recommendation for uh, smoking to be? Well, the recommendation, as you may have expected, is that there's no safe form of tobacco, there's no safe amount of tobacco. The American Cancer Society advises people to stay tobacco-free, which is the best way to protect one's health. And obviously, invariably, uh, protection, health protection from smoking cessation is not only um, helpful in cancer prevention, it's helpful in the prevention of many diseases, especially the non-communicable diseases. It uh, optimizes the health outcomes in many diseases. Smoking cessation is one of the lifestyle factors that have a great potential in reversing disease conditions. Now, moving on to additional factors that may contribute to carcinogenesis, it's important to keep in mind the role of energy intake and body weight. So as we have mentioned on multiple occasions during the presentation today, obesity on its own is a risk factor for some cancers, and it may account for up to 20% of all cancer-related mortality. So definitely the state of overweight or obesity increases the risk for multifold for um, the occurrence of cancer or the incidence of cancer and mortality from cancer. So what is the effect of uh, energy intake and body weight? And how does it uh, increase the risk for it? Uh, for example, let's start with one factor at a time. The healthy body weight is the second most important lifestyle factor in reducing cancer risk. I leave it to you to think of what the first most important lifestyle factor in reducing cancer risk would be. So maintaining a healthy body weight status uh, is really important. Did you guess what number one is? I believe you did. It's the tobacco use, really. Um, so uh, having a healthy body weight status is se the second most important lifestyle factor to reduce cancer risk after not using uh, tobacco. Uh, an, an additional or another additional point that's important to consider here is that overweight and obesity are now much more prevalent uh, than ever. 
uh, and the whole world, really. So it's definitely a factor that's going to contribute more and more to increasing cancer risk as uh, with modernization and with um, time. There are 2 billion adults who are living with overweight and obesity in the world. It's definitely not something to be taken lightly or the effect of it on cancer risk should not be considered as minor. Uh, there is strong evidence that being overweight uh, or living with obesity throughout adulthood increases the risk of at least 14 cancers. And this includes uh, the cancer of the mouth, the pharynx and larynx. Uh, also um, cancers of the stomach, pancreatic cancer, and gallbladder cancer. Um, body fat is also a contributing factor to increased cancer risk, body fat alone. Uh, body fat is a metabolically active tissue. For, uh, in, the, in the olden days, it was thought that body fat has no function except to store body. But with time and further research, it's now being more and more accepted and understood that body fat is a met metabolically active tissue that produces estrogen, for example, and many other hormones, obviously, that have to do with appetite. But particularly, estrogen is of, is, uh, is of great relevance here in cancer. Um, formation or carcinogenesis because we have seen earlier that cancer is one of the sex hormones that increase the risk for breast cancer. So uh, not only does it produce estrogen and other hormones but it also produces proteins that cause a high level of insulin and other hormones and what was the name of the hormone that uh, induces growth and cell proliferation that was the insulin-like growth factor. Uh, leptin also all of those can lead to um, inflammation to cell proliferation, thus include increasing the risk for cancer formation. Uh, another important factor is that the longer a person is overweight, the more significant the association is with the incidence of all obesity-related cancers. So being uh, obese for some time is, is much better than being <laughs> obese for a longer time because the longer the duration, the more the likelihood of cancer formation. For example, in postmenopausal breast and endometrial cancer, every 10 year increase in adulthood overweight status is associated with a 5% and 17% increase in risk, respectively. So there will be 5% increase in uh, postmenopausal breast cancer and 17% increase in endometrial cancer with every 10 year increase in adulthood overweight status. So I've been uh, overweight for my entire life. Is it going to make any difference if I lose weight or normalize my body weight now? Yes, of course it is because the duration is a big factor not only in cancer risk, but it also is a factor in the risk for other non-communicable diseases, including diabetes and uh, blood pressure, hypertension. What is the recommendation then? It's important to keep weight within the healthy range and avoid weight gain in adult life. So uh, the phases of life in which weight gain happens is also a very important factor. We do not want any... Um, uh, weight gain in any phase or any excessive weight gain in any phase or any cycle in any cycle in the life cycle uh, but definitely not in the adulthood and definitely not for a long time. Another recommendation by the World Cancer Research Fund International is to keep your weight within the healthy range and avoid weight gain in adult life. So when we talk about the healthy weight range, we're talking about a BMI between 18.5 to 24.9. Uh, obviously, with certain ethnicities, uh, the BMI range is a little bit different. And also within certain age groups, the BMI range is a little bit different. So what is an optimum BMI range or an optimum BMI for one category of people is not necessarily the same for others. Now, with respect to children and adolescents, uh, we also need to ensure that the body weight during these two phases projects towards the lower end of the healthy adult BMI range. So we want to, their BMI, while growing up, we want their BMI to be as close to the healthy adult range as possible, but toward the lower end. And obviously avoid weight gain in adult life. An additional factor that is uh, absolutely necessary to be explored when talking about potential carcinogenicity uh, is chemical exposures.
When it comes to chemical exposures, it's no secret that uh, activities that we do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, can expose people to different types of chemicals. And there are many vectors for that. It could happen through air, it could happen through water, food, beverages. And these exposures very likely can cause many different types of cancers. So what exposures are we particularly referring to? The chemical exposures we are referring to include pesticides and herbicides. Um, higher exposure to pesticides and herbicides increases cancer incidence. Studies of people with high exposures to pesticides, including agricultural workers such as farmers and crop duster pilots, these have higher rates of overall cancer incidence, as well as increased risk of particular cancers such as leukemia and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or multiple myeloma, uh, among other cancers. There are specific types of cancers associated with specific pesticide application and exposure, so different pesticides can lead to different types of cancers. This brings us to the discussion of whether or not it's uh, worth uh, our while to go and buy organically produced crops instead of using conventionally, conventionally produced crops using pesticides and herbicides. So studies have shown that organically produced foods are less likely than conventionally grown foods to contain pesticide residues. That's a fact. However, a large study presented in the British Journal of Cancer found that consumption of organic food was not associated with a reduction in the incidence of all cancer, soft tissue sarcoma, or breast cancer. So what's the verdict? At this time, risk of cancer or a decreased nutritional value are not reasons to avoid conventionally grown uh, produce. For patients, however, who are concerned about limiting their pesticide exposure or who have environmental concerns, purchasing organic food is an option. Another category of chemical exposures include air pollutants. Uh, these include nitrogen dioxide, ozone, carbon mon monoxide, among others, and all of those pose additional health risks, particularly for lung cancer. And obviously heavy metals as the occupational exposures, these are associated with uh, increased health threats, including cancer formation. A topic or a particular uh, compound has been uh, under scrutiny for a few years in the past. Uh, it has been a buzz in the uh, world of nutrition and food safety and whether or not it's a carcinogen and whether or not it's safe for, cons for uh, food consumption and food preservation. Uh, this is bisphenol A or BPA. Many people buy BPA free products they, uh, because they are under the impression that they have uh, better cancer protection properties. So what is the beef when it comes to bisphenol A? Let's discuss this together. Let's start the discussion by trying to understand a little bit more what bisphenol A is. So it's an industrial chemical that has been used since the 1960s in the manufacturing of many plastic-based products, um, products that have to do with food, food uh, storage, and food transportation. So you can find it in for example, hard plastic bottles, um, bottles of water, bottles of beverages that you can consume, ketchup, ketchup bottles, um, bottles of hygiene products and uh, detergents and so on. It is also found in the linings of metal-based food and beverage cans, such as the ones that you can see in the picture. And it's found uh, as epoxy resin, which is used in uh, paints and adhesives. So all of those are products that contain bisphenol A. So what's the whole fuss about it then? The uh, well, multiple studies have demonstrated that BPA may disrupt the function of so, uh, some hormones, including uh, sex hormones, uh, including also leptin and insulin and thyroxin, all of which cause hepatotoxic, immunologic and carcinogenic effects. So what did the US Department of Health and Human Services uh, say? It really supports eliminating BPA from all food-related products uh, production. So look for things that are BPA-free. There are different measures that you can do to avoid the use of BPA. Uh, do not use single-use plastic bottles. If you have to look for BPA-free ones, uh, use uh, um, glass 
uh, Tupperwares or containers, food containers rather than plastic ones. And if you have to use plastic ones, choose the non-BPA ones or BPA free ones and so on and so forth. I'm sure many of you are familiar with how to reduce BPA, but let's have a quick uh, review on the um, debate that has happened on BPA. So the original safety studies from the 1960s and a little bit uh, later um, indicated that BPA is safe to use in food and beverage containers at the amounts that they are used. So the FDA in 2014 stated that the health threat is overrated. So there has been a big, a bigger buzz about uh, BPA than uh, it should have or than there should have. So the FDA uh, said that it is safe at the, at the amounts that are available in the food industry. Multiple studies, however, have uh, said that it disrupts the function of some hormones, as I mentioned, and the current goal really is to reduce the use and exposure to BPA, and there are multiple actions that should be taken to achieve that, and I've mentioned some examples on what could be done for that matter. We cannot conclude the discussion on chemical exposures without touching upon genetically modified foods uh, briefly. So genetically modified foods are foods that have been modified at the genetic level to incur additional um, characteristics to these foods that aren't originally found when they are grown conventionally, such as being resistant to insects, uh, so insects would not be able to bite through them. Uh, they will, uh, this will make these products uh, have a better shelf life and improve the crops, improve the uh, produce, the amount that is being collected. Biotechnology in agriculture includes these uh, organisms, GMOs, genetically modified organisms, such as corn and soybean crops, among so many other products. Now, some people fear that there's a link between cancer and GMOs. Uh, despite the fact that studies do not show that the process of genetic modification is a risk for cancer formation. The National Academy of Sciences has reviewed the safety of GM crops and found that they pose no unique hazards to human health, including cancer incidents. Ongoing evaluation of GMO safety is important to understanding the long-term effects of GMOs on human health and the environment in general. So would there be a different uh, statement in a few years time? Maybe, it depends on the evidence that is still being collected and gathered. Um, for many food recommendations, really, uh, despite the lack of evidence or the presence of some evidence, uh, we can exercise as consumers, we have um, the privilege of choice. So we can exercise this capacity of choice and make a choice that sounds, um, you know, that makes us comfortable in terms of what we want to consume and what we do not want to consume. So if people are still would like to be more cautious regarding genetically modified crops, by all means do um, make the choice that uh, makes you feel comfortable. Now that we have discussed multiple factors that can contribute to carcinogenesis, uh, based on this discussion and the knowledge that you already have, what do you expect the cancer prevention recommendations to include? So we've seen factors, dietary or otherwise, that can contribute to cancer formation. And now the recommendations are going to target those factors uh, for avoidance or for consuming more of. Uh, so what do you think the recommendations for cancer prevention are going to include? You know what to do by now. Kindly pause the video for a few minutes, uh, brainstorm, jot down some of the cancer recommendations that you believe are going to be uh, communicated or are, are essential to be communicated and come back to check the cancer recommendations as voiced by uh, different uh, governing bodies. I hope you have included as many of those factors as Possible. So the cancer prevention recommendations by the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute of Cancer Research uh, includes multiple factors, some of them being dietary, some of them being non-dietary. So at the core of it is not smoking and avoiding other exposures to tobacco. And there's also the avoidance of excessive 
exposure to sun due to the ionizing radiation that may contribute to cancer formation, particularly skin cancer. And this is also important in reducing the cancer risk. So let's look very quickly at the different factors in this infographic. Be at a healthy weight in all of the stages of your life. Be physically active and the physical activity recommendations are to follow. Eat a rich diet. Uh, it's rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruit and beans. Limit the consumption of fast foods and other processed foods that are high in fat, starches or sugars. Limit the consumption of red and processed meats. These are the ones uh, that have been uh, proven to be carcinogenic. Limit the consumption of sugar, sweetened drinks. Uh, limit alcohol consumption and do not use supplements for cancer prevention. It does not mean that under no uh, conditions uh, there, there would be absolutely no reason for a person to use supplementation. Of course, supplementation may be warranted in specific conditions. What is meant by this recommendation is that the minerals and the vitamins that should be part of your diet should come from the diet. They should be adequately consumed from the diet rather than consuming an inadequate diet and relying on supplementation to uh, reduce or to attempt to reduce cancer risk. So your diet should be versatile enough to include the essential micronutrients, obviously, and the macronutrients as well, to make sure that there are no deficiencies uh, are present, which will boost your immune system and improve your uh, regulatory <clears throat> mechanisms for cancer prevention. For mothers, breastfeeding the baby is uh, an additional factor that can uh, protect from cancer formation. And after a cancer diagnosis, it's not too late to follow these recommendations if a person was not following them before a cancer diagnosis. Additional uh, points is that following these recommendations will likely uh, make a person reduce his or her intake of salt and saturated and trans fats, which together will help prevent other non-communicable diseases. Again, it's always a holistic point of view rather than just cancer uh, prevention. So moving on, now we're going to discuss dietary carcinogen inhib inhibitors. And we're talking about things like antioxidants and phytochemicals and other components that are naturally found in uh, food. Let's start by discussing chemo prevention. So chemo prevention is defined as the use of drugs or other agents to reduce the risk uh, or delay the development or delay, delay the recurrence of cancer. So many natural products or molecules are currently being investigated for their chemo prevention potential. And this includes uh, hundreds of polyphenols in fruits and vegetables and in green tea and in, um, for example, curcumin and, um, and red grapes and berries. Uh, phenolic acid, um, flavonoids, and lignans, for example, are the most abundant polyphenols, and their chemopreventive potential comes from their ability to modulate epigenetic alterations in cancer cells. What, what, what do we mean when we talk about epigenetic um, alterations? So um, when we talk about epigenetics, it's the ability or the potential for a certain gene or a certain set of genes to either be expressed or not expressed based on environmental factors. So yes, it's true that our genes are part of our DNA strands, but it does not mean that all genes are necessarily going to be expressed. There are modulatory uh, uh, aspects that are either going to cause them to be expressed or not get expressed. We're talking about specific genes, obviously, or to be expressed to a certain degree. And some of those factors include the diet and nutrition in general, nutritional status. So some uh, factors would either cause a gene to be expressed or stop it from being expressed or limit how expressed it's going to be. And this is uh, where uh, nutrition has a potential of modulating gene expression uh, to either increase uh, the risk of developing cancer or reduce the risk of developing cancer, depending on whether the agent is a carcinogenesis promoter or inhibitor. Um, antioxidants and bioactive compounds are investigated for chemo prevention potential. And many of these substances really uh, have possibly have complementary and they have overlapping mechanisms by which they uh, delay cancer formation or prevent it altogether. And this includes antioxidant uh, abilities or properties. The antioxidant, when we talk about antioxidants, these are the agents that are going to reduce the oxidative stress. Uh, that is a mechanism that has been postulated as leading to cancer formation. Uh, it also has anti-angiogenesis, which means it stops the cancer growth 
uh, immune modulating, detox enzyme enhancing, anti proliferative stops the uh, cell division, and nitrosamine formation inhibiting properties. We've seen nitrosamine being a potential um, modulator of the DNA. Uh, in addition to diluting and binding carcinogens in the digestive tract and altering hormone metabol metabolism, all of these mechanisms are relevant to cancer prevention. Uh, the epigenetic modification step usually occurs early in the development of a cancer, when uh, the reversal of these changes is uh, still potential. Uh, there is a potential for uh, reversing any change that has happened at this stage that will cause carcinogenesis. So some of the dietary carcinogen inhibitors, um, not a surprise because we've talked about it multiple times, and it's one of the things that are very thoroughly studied in the literature. Uh, these are antioxidants. Um, so dietary carcinogen inhibitors include antioxidants such as vitamin C and vitamin E and selenium and zinc. And they also contain phytochemicals, which are biologically active compounds of, components sorry, of many plants. Uh, dietary antioxidants are important because they scavenge and neutralize free radicals. Uh, what are free radicals? We're going to discuss this in a minute. Um, so once uh, antioxidants uh, scavenge free radicals and neutralize them, uh, they prevent them from causing damage to the body and they protect against ex oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is a proposed mechanism in carcinogenesis, as you guys have seen. So what are free radicals? They are highly reactive oxygen species or chemicals that have the potential to harm cells. Uh, they are the natural byproducts of multiple uh, metabolic reactions that happen in the body. They are created when an atom or a molecule uh, either gains or loses an electron, so it becomes excited. Uh, free radicals are formed naturally in the body as a result of metabolic reactions, as I mentioned earlier, and they play an important role in many normal cellular processes. Now, when they become at a higher concentration than it sh they should, free radicals can be hazardous to the body, and it can damage all major components of cells. Uh, it can damage the DNA, the proteins, and the cell membrane. The damage to cells caused by free radicals, particularly the damage to DNA, may play a very important role in the development of cancer in other conditions. Uh, antioxidants are either endogenous, they are produced endogenously inside the body, or exogenous, and they can be consumed through the diet. So definitely antioxidant consumption is a great favor to do for your body as it fights oxidative stress um, especially if uh, it's being given additional uh, stress <laughs> that causes oxidative stress. Now, this table here shows us some phytochemicals, phytochemicals in vegetables and fruits that may have cancer protective properties. Uh, notice that it tells us what the phytochemical is and it also tells us where it is found and its potential benefits. Uh, the thing that I would really like to point out here is the color. So uh, when you think about eating fruits and vegetables or when you want to give advice to your uh, clients about consuming fruits and vegetables, a very common um, piece of advice is eat a rainbow. So basically eat a variety of colors from fruits and vegetables. People often tend to say I eat in a healthy way because I eat fruits and vegetables. But what they do is that they eat the fruits and the vegetables that they usually like and prefer so they have a banana and an apple every day and they have um, a carrot and um, a tomato and that's that but really what we have to do is to eat a rainbow which means to make sure to make um, a conscious effort of including uh, fruits and vegetables of different colors because all of the different colors include different phytochemicals which can fight different types of cancer so for an ultimate protection from all cancer types eat a rainbow so just to give you an example, red color includes the phytochemical lycopene and could be found in tomatoes and uh, pink grapefruit and watermelon, and it protects against prostate cancer. It's important to think about yellow and green. It's important to think about purple as well, because each of them have preventive or cancer protective properties of different types and for different reasons. Can antioxidants really prevent cancer? This is the question that uh, we need to ask ourselves. We talk a lot about antioxidants, about the importance of having a high um, supply of antioxidants in our um, food. But does it really prevent cancer? This is a question that has been attempted in multiple studies. 
Uh, in lab and animal studies, the presence of increased levels of exogenous ant uh, antioxidants has been shown to prevent the types of free radical damage that have been associated with cancer development. So this is all good news. It's great stuff. However, in humans, uh, there have been nine randomized controlled trials of dietary antioxidant supplements for cancer prevention. And note here the word supplements. So we're talking about supplementation and not taking it from the, its natural source. Uh, so these nine randomized controlled trials or RCTs, which is um, probably the best way or the best type of studies that inform uh, nutrition um, studies or nutrition experts, uh, these have been conducted in, worldwide. Overall, these nine randomized controlled trials um, did not provide evidence that dietary antioxidant supplements are beneficial in primary cancer preven prevention. Why is this the case? It's possible that the lack of benefits in these studies can be explained by differences in the effects of the tested antioxidants when they are consumed as purified chemicals as opposed to when they are consumed in foods because when they are in food, there are other compounds or complex mixtures of antioxidants and vitamins and minerals, all of which might, might have uh, a better uh, effect, a better cancer protection effect. Uh, in fact, uh, in multiple um, uh, governing bodies that produce guidelines for nutritionists, uh, it's always been uh, a statement that consuming food in its natural form is much better than taking it in a supplement form and this is why the cancer recommendation was do not take supplements for uh, improving your cancer risk rather take it or take the uh, the dietary uh, agent that protects from cancer in its most natural form so eat um, your food as close to nature as it can be for multiple or ultimate health benefits So in addition to the antioxidants and fruits and vegetables, let's talk a little bit about the plant-based diet. These are naturally higher in uh, fiber content and low in red meat consumption, obviously. Uh, most diets that are protected against cancer are rich in foods of plant origin, really and truly. And uh, as I said earlier, plant-based does not necessarily mean vegan or vegetarian. It just means that the majority of the food items in this diet are from a plant origin. Uh, also, uh, the recommendation or some of the inhibitors of carcinogenesis is whole grains, consumption of whole grains. These contain starch and protein and fiber, B vitamins and other micronutrients. And there's evidence that eating these whole grains with their um, uh, important constituents and eating fiber and vegetables and fruits can help protect against certain cancers, as well as, which is very important, against weight gain, overweight and obesity. We've seen that all of those are additional risk factors for cancer formation. A vegan diet appeared to protect against cancer more than any other dietary pattern. So for cancer protection, consume whole grains. Uh, these uh, <clears throat> improve your chances of not getting colorectal cancer, and you should include whole grains in most meals. Uh, Fiber-rich food also protects from colorectal cancer on protects from uh, weight gain, overweight and obesity, and it should be at least 30 grams per day. Obviously this recommendation is different depending on the recommending body. Uh, other recommendations would say 20, at least 28 grams per day for adults, uh, which is equivalent to 14 grams per 1,000 uh, kilocalories, so this might be different. For children it's a little bit different, but anyway, you get the idea. The idea is that the recommendation might be different, but consume, make a uh, a conscious choice of including enough fiber in your food. Fruits and vegetables uh, have cancer protective effects, particularly when consuming non-starchy vegetables, and these should be included in most meals. Plant food, there should be five portions of plant foods a day, and uh, plant sources should be diversified. Eat a rainbow, make sure you're eating of everything and not just being um, biased to one thing over the other. that fight cancer. Here are some um, foods that have been uh, isolated in this um, table from the American Institute for Cancer Research. Uh, you can notice that uh, there are different types and you can notice that one of the recurring themes is the presence of fiber, fiber in most of them, 
uh, vitamins A and C, which are antioxidants, and so many other uh, phytochemicals. I will, you can pause the video here and have a quick look to see where, uh, which superfoods have which bioactive compound that are uh, protective against cancer formation. So what are the recommendations with respect to whole grains, fruits, and vegetables? The World Cancer Research Fund International recommends uh, people to make whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and pulses, which are legumes, such as beans and lentils, a major part of your usual daily diet. What are additional factors that we need to look at in terms of cancer um, protection? Uh, it's definitely, at this point, dairy products and milk. Let's have a quick look. Milk and dairy products may have a protective effect against cancer formation. There is strong evidence that consuming dairy products decreases the risk of colorectal cancer, and this is due to many nutrients that can be found in these products. Let's have a look. Um, agents that have been discussed include calcium. The study results regarding calcium cancer protective um, properties have been inconsistent, but there's a tendency to have a reduced risk of colorectal cancer with increased intake of calcium. The same is true with respect to vitamin D. Study results are inconclusive, but it has been suggested that higher vitamin D intake or higher blood level of vitamin D has a reduced colorectal cancer risk, is associated with reduced colorectal cancer risk. With respect to coffee and tea, again, study results are inconclusive, but they contain antioxidants, which may make them a little bit more protective against cancer. What is the recommendation with respect to um, those micronutrients found in uh, milk and dairy products, as well as other micronutrients that people may think that if they supplement um, this may uh, decrease the risk of cancer formation. The World Cancer Research Fund International suggests that it is best to eat a healthy diet rather than rely on dietary supplements to protect against cancer. And this, as you have seen in the infographic earlier, is one of the recommendations by the Cancer Society on how to prevent cancer formation. And I elaborated a little bit on that because it's really important. Uh, the more uh, naturally that we consume a micronutrient, the more likely we are to benefit from it to the fullest. Now that we've discussed the dietary factors that have a chemo prevention potential, let's talk about additional agents, particularly one extremely important agent that has great uh, chemo prevention potential. We have discussed it earlier, but I decided to put it in a separate section due to its importance. We are talking about physical activity. So for physical activity, there's strong evidence that physical activity protects against cancers of the colon, the breast, and the endometrium and how to prevent excess weight gain. Again, weight gain is a risk factor for cancer formation on its own. So when it comes to physical activity, we're going to be talking mainly about walking. Why walking? Because it's one of the most accessible exercise um, methods, if you want, or ways, and most studied ways. And evidence for walking and for aerobic physical activity is really strong that it protects against weight gain overweight and obesity. So even if the cancer risk, um, if the decrease in the cancer risk is not a direct correlation, once it correlates directly with other cancer risk factors, it becomes a really important um, a factor to consider. Uh, walking and aerobic physical activity, these are two of the most researched activities. Obviously, there are many more uh, physical activities that could be done and could have a protective effect on cancer formation. So this is not only the only two that we're talking about, but I've mentioned them here just because of how strong the evidence is. Aerobic physical activity also probably protects against gain, uh, weight gain, overweight and obesity, uh, all of which increase the risk of cancer. So physical activity may indirectly reduce the risk of obesity-related cancer due to its effect on body weight 
and weight gain and the state of obesity and the degree of body fatness and all of the other risk factors that we have discussed as being non-dietary yet related to cancer formation. Uh, to help reduce the risk, this is an important recommendation by the World Cancer Research Fund International, to help reduce the risk of cancer, be physically active as part of everyday life, walk more and sit less. So this is a very important statement, walk more and sit less, because uh, even the number of hours of sitting have been associated with increased risk for different non-communicable diseases um, in humans. So breaking the um, time that is spent in sitting down is really important in uh, protection against non-communicable diseases. Just like physical activity has been associated with uh, improving uh, the chances of not um, developing cancer, the lack of physical activity increases the risk. Screen time is a very good indicator or marker for sedentary living, and it is a cause of weight gain in children and in adults, so we need to uh, reduce it. And as I said, just sitting down for long hours in front of a screen, in front of a computer, in front of, uh, I don't know, any way, uh, and for any reason, even if you're sitting down for a conference, uh, break uh, this uh, time that you are sitting by uh, getting up, moving around, walking for at least 250 steps and going back to sit down. Uh, this alone improves your um, chances for not developing uh, non-communicable diseases. Body fatness is another uh, risk factor for cancer formation. And it is usually associated with sedentary living. The greater body fatness is, the greater the risk for many cancers as well as any as many other disease uh, conditions. What are the most common recommendations with respect to physical activity then? Um, I'd like you to think about it, research it, and come back to listen to the rest of the discussion regarding recommendations on physical activity. The uh, general recommendation for physical activity for adults is to have at least 150 minutes of physical activity per week. This is We're talking about moderate to vigorous physical activity per week uh, without going for more than uh, three days without any physical activity. And it has to be spread over uh, the week. Um, this could be divided into things like um, five 30 minute sessions, three 50 minute sessions, uh, also vigorous activity. If it's only vigorous activity, it could be 75 minutes per week. Um, these recommendations differ between children and between the elderly. And uh, all of those uh, um, recommendations have been made with um, keeping in mind the um, benefit and the reduced risk of non-communicable diseases that physical activity uh, renders on uh, people of different ages. So for example, children, they have to have at least 60 minutes of physical activity per day, and they have to have unstructured playing time. Uh, for uh, adults, they have uh, also to have 150 minutes per week, and those of them who cannot achieve that recommendation have to go for as close to the recommendation as possible within their unique set of circumstances and physical abilities. So definitely physical activity is something not to be taken lightly in terms of its protective effects on overall health and particularly uh, on cancer risk and on diabetes risk and on multiple uh, other um, lifestyle related diseases. Uh, for physical activity, it is important to uh, start it or continue it, uh, start it any, at any point in time in your life and to stick to it as part of your lifestyle rather than uh, just something you have to do. It does not have to be done in a gym. It has to be, it could be done anywhere as long as you are making the effort to uh, keeping it or to keep it as part of your daily uh, routine over the whole week. Uh, so a general um, statement was also to start low and go slow. So people often uh, say that I cannot do 150 minutes or I cannot walk for more than 10 minutes. Uh, the, the rule of thumb here is that any physical activity is better than no physical activity. Start low and go slow. Start with what you can do and build upon that gradually until you reach to a stage where you can follow the recommendations for your unique um, life or stage of life or your unique set of uh, medical medical and health conditions. Um, it's also important to understand that 
uh, the effect of physical activity adds up. So it's not like if you do not do the 30 minutes continuously, you're not supposed to do anything. You can do 10 minutes in the morning and another 10 minutes uh, at lunch or after lunchtime. Uh, these, the effects of these will add up. Uh, there will be many constraints and many excuses made by many people on why they cannot engage in physical activity, but there are really so many other ways by which we can um, overcome uh, these uh, obstacles and um, point out to our clients how these can be overcome. Uh, I hope I have made the physical activity uh, aspect uh, as important as it really is. I hope I have highlighted I have highlighted it enough. We are going to review very quickly the cancer uh, prevention recommendations, whether dietary or otherwise, uh, with our focus on the dietary, obviously. So we have seen the recommendations uh, from one source, the World Cancer Research Fund International. Now we're going to look at the recommendations from the WHO report on cancer. Obviously, there's going to be so many points in common, but there are a few additional points that the WHO make that are intrinsically mentioned also in the cancer report for the National Institute for Health, uh, the National Cancer um, Strategy. Uh, so some of these ways include not to smoke or use any form of tobacco. As we have mentioned regarding smoking, there's a causal uh, relationship between smoke and cancer carcinogenesis, and this include uh, uh, tobacco smoking and the non-smoking like chewing tobacco and the secondhand smoking. All of those have been associated with increased cancer risk and all of those have been uh, mentioned as a group one carcinogen. Uh, this follows with the second point, make your home smoke-free and support smoke-free policies in your wake workplace. So because secondhand smoking is another uh, carcinogen that has been identified, it's important to make your home and your workplace uh, smoke-free and to support any policies that are made in this uh, account or in this respect. Number three, which is very important, as you have seen, maintain a healthy body weight, and this is true for all stages of your life cycle. It's important for children. It's important in adulthood. It's important in the um, el elderly stage of life. Uh, the longer the duration of overweight or obesity status, the, in the more increased the cancer risk is going to be. It's important to maintain a healthy uh, weight range. It's important to remain within the lower end of the healthy weight range for your uh, stage of life or for your age. Uh, be being overweight for a longer duration, especially in middle ages, uh, gives you a much higher risk of having uh, cancer later in life. Uh, however, um, weight loss should not be attempted in the elderly unless it is absolutely necessary and it should be attempted while keeping in mind the importance of keeping protein at an adequate intake because lack of protein in the elderly could lead to many uh, diseases. Number four is being physically active in everyday life and limit the time that you spend sitting. I've given you a recommendation regarding the physical uh, activity and I've given you um, also another recommendation regarding cutting down the time that you spend sitting. There are um, the smart watches that nowadays give you uh, by the end, for example, by the end of the of the hour, 10 minutes into like after 50 minutes of a certain hour of the day, it will give you a notification that you have been sedentary for the past 50 minutes. Please get up and walk for at least 250 steps or just move around. It will give you a notification once you have done that. These are good reminders. You can do that on your smartphone as well or any uh, reminder or any alarm for that matter. So there are multiple ways for us to remind ourselves and make conscious efforts into being physically active. Again, it does not have to happen in a gym. You can park your car a little further away. You can use the stairs. You can walk more often to places rather than riding uh, a car. So being physically active really is a matter of prioritizing it as part of your, of your lifestyle as opposed to making a specific time for it 
uh, during your day to go to a gym or to be engaged in structured classes. It really is not supposed to be something that gives you a burden. It's supposed to be a way for you to relieve your stress and to increase uh, or improve your overall health status. Eat a healthy diet. A healthy diet includes major or main uh, points such as eating a lot of whole grains, pulses, vegetables, and fruits, limiting the consumption of high calorie foods, which are high in sugar and fat or fat, and avoid sugary drinks, sugar sweetened beverage, beverages, avoiding processed meat and limiting red meat and foods with high salt content. We have seen that salt as a preservation, ex uh, the use of so much salt as a preservation technique, the addition of nitrates and nitrites, uh, use the use of processed meats. All of those are group one carcinogens, which are carcinogenic to humans. So uh, the, the more you can limit them, the less is your risk, the more reduced your risk is to develop cancer. Uh, limit your alcohol intake. Do not drink alcohol. Avoid too much sun exposure. We have talked about the potential for ionizing radiation uh, from the sun, especially for children. Use sun protection when you have to be uh, in the outdoors and avoid sun beds because they increase your exposure to ionizing radiation. Uh, now, when it comes to um, chemical exposures, uh, occupational hazards in the workplace, protect yourself against cancer causing substances, follow the health and safety instructions and report anything that is um, worrisome. Uh, determine whether you are exposed to radiation from high radon levels in your home and reduce the high radon levels. Uh, as you can notice in the WHO recommendations, there's also a big uh, focus on the environmental factors and not just the lifestyle and the dietary factors. For women, uh, breastfeeding is an important cancer prevention step. Breastfeeding the baby uh, when a woman is able to breastfeed, obviously, it reduces the risk for cancer for the mom, breast cancer in particular, uh, and limit the use of hormone replacement therapies, which increase the risk of certain cancers. Obviously, this is a big discussion to have with the physician when the need for uh, hormone replace, replacement therapy is there and what is the balance between uh, the cancer risk and the need for hormone replacement therapy and what alternative approaches can be uh, taken into account when symptoms need to be uh, minimized. Um, vaccination is another important um, way for reducing cancer risk with particular vaccinations, obviously. Uh, to reduce your child's risk of certain cancers, ensure that your children are vaccinated against hepatitis B for newborns and HPV, human papillo papillomavirus. And finally, take part in organized cancer screening programs. Uh, so many uh, countries and governments have different cancer screening programs that are continuously taking place. If you fit within the criteria for the screening within the age groups, please do take part in these cancer screening programs. And this is particularly important for bulk cancer for both men and women, for breast cancer for women and for cervical cancers. Follow the recommendations of a screening for your age group. Uh, seek a screening when it's not being done around you in a systematic approach. Uh, make sure you're aware of the wellness centers around you. If you're a woman, uh, if you're a woman, look for uh, women wellness centers and get checked for the cancers that need to be checked at certain ages. Go for your periodic uh, screening. If you're uh, a man, also go for prostate cancer screening when uh, the recommendations state that you should, depending on where you are living, and be part, be actively engaged in reducing your own cancer risk, uh, be um, responsible for your own health, take leadership and ownership uh, of your own health, and do not just wait for opportunities to arise. Seek these opportunities to, to reduce your cancer risk and uh, follow up with uh, your physician on what needs to be done and when it needs to be done.
Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this webinar. If you have any questions or for more information about the professional training programs offered by the Continuing and Professional Education Directorate at UDST, please contact the CPE team through the email or phone number provided here.